The next item of business is a debate on motion 2948 in the name of Jean Freeman on creating a Fairer Scotland, our disability delivery plan. Uh, members may wish to note that British Sign Language interpreters are present in the chamber today and will be signing this afternoon's business. Would members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move the motion. 13 minutes please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this debate on A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People, our Disability Delivery Plan to 2021, published last week to coincide with the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Over a million disabled people contribute to Scotland's communities, bringing talent, energy and ability, all adding richness to our lives. Now, 2016 is the 20th anniversary of the Disability Discrimination Act, but for many disabled people, too many, their ambitions, their dreams and their promise is denied to them because of the barriers in their way. Inaccessible communication, negative attitudes, low expectations, discrimination and inequality affect the lives and the chances of disabled people every single day. The disability isn't the problem. It's the barriers we allow to stand in their way. Removing those barriers and achieving equality of opportunity is the transformational change this government wants for Scotland. Two months ago, we launched the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, setting out specific actions that we need to take to move Scotland towards where we need it to be, a fairer and more economically and socially just country. The Fairer Scotland Action Plan is there to work for everyone in Scotland. But not everyone starts from the same place. For disabled people, we need to tackle the particular barriers that they face. These barriers to living the independent life that every disabled person has a right to are barriers that we, who are not disabled, either put in their way or allow to stay unchallenged. Our homes, our transport, our workplaces, our public services and our local environments are all too often designed or operate in ways that exclude disabled people. We have to change that with a genuine transformational change in our attitude and our approach. Disabled people and the organisations that represent them have worked incredibly hard with us to identify the critical actions we need to take to secure that change across government, across the public and the third sector, and including the private sector too. Many are here today in the public gallery and have contributed directly to this plan. And I want to thank all of you and the hundreds more who took part in the consultation events for your continuing help and support to us. The plan outlines five clear long-term ambitions. Support services that meet disabled people's needs, decent incomes and fairer working lives, places that are accessible to everyone, protected rights and active participation. They are all achievable, but we know that the scale and the extent of the change that is necessary in the experience and the life chances of disabled people will take concerted action over this parliament and beyond. So working with disabled people, we've set out the 93 specific concrete actions that need to be taken to make significant progress towards those ambitions by 2021. We're not starting from scratch. We have made significant advances in important areas of policy and service delivery, including self-directed support, supported employment, strengthening building standards and our new accessible travel framework. And I hope that the action we have taken in response to the UK government's policy decisions, including welfare cuts and in our clear principles of respect and dignity that we will build in to the establishment of our own secure, social security system in Scotland, show that we are serious about protecting disabled people's human rights. As members in this chamber will know, this Saturday, the 10th of December, is Human Rights Day. And this year, the UN has drawn particular attention to the need to stand up for the rights of disabled people. The call to action, the theme for Human Rights Day 2016, challenges us all to do more. This Scottish Government will take on that challenge and our delivery plan commits us to increasing the pace and the depth of change. Let me draw out some of the key commitments we have made. 
We will work with disabled people, local authorities and providers to reform adult social care so that we shift its focus to achieving independent living. And next year, we will begin work to consult on the future of long-term care capacity. In self-directed support, we know there is more to do to make the information about it and the rights it brings more widely available and understood, and to improve access and reinforce its focus on the individual's choice and control. And with COSLA and disabled people, we will improve the portability of care and support packages between local authorities. We will promote independent advocacy so that people know about and can claim their rights in mental health. We will work together to improve the best possible provision and support so that all our young people can grow up to meet their full potential through our new national framework for families with disabled children and the commitment we have made to improve the transitions from education to training and employment. I will. Alex to, Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention and we are very supportive of the introduction of a framework for families affected by disability. But the title would suggest that this may not include those people, those young people affected by disability who are on supervision order are looked after. Can she confirm that these will these people will be included in this new strategy or framework? Jean Freeman. Yes, I can. The, the strategy itself will be worked through with disabled people and with those who care uh, for children uh, with disabilities, and it will include all children, because we are talking about the rights of all disabled people and young people. We, we know that we need to align learning and skills better, so we will look to promote the project search model, introduce our own voluntary and person-led pre-employment support programme, deliver on the specific improvement targets to make our modern apprenticeship programmes genuinely accessible to disabled people, including part-time and flexible engagement, and with immediate effect, provide young disabled people with the highest level of modern apprenticeship funding until the age of 30. To help employers see the employee's potential and not the barrier, we will actively promote the Department of Work and Pensions Access to Work Scheme and from next year, providers of our devolved employment services will be required to make sure that disabled people are supported to claim and receive the access to work money so that they can sustain employment. Disabled people's organisations tell us it's getting the first opportunity to work that is the barrier that can affect future work and life chances. So a new work experience pilot for young disabled people together with the 120 place internship programme across the public and third sector shows, I hope, our intention to make a real difference in removing the barriers to employment that many young disabled people face. We need all of this in place to transform employment opportunities open to disabled people. Because we want to at least halve the employment gap between disabled people in Scotland and the rest of the working age population. And we will consult on setting a clear target for employment levels in the public sector, where only just under 12% of employees are disabled. Disabled people have as much creativity and enterprise as anyone else and as many good ideas and business brains. So we will stimulate more pre-start activity for social enterprise and provide support for the setup of micro and social enterprises. In transport, the new accessible travel framework developed with disabled people and transport providers carries a number of specific steps to make public transport more accessible and importantly, to involve disabled people in key areas of decision-making. Disabled people should be supported in or out of work. Our approach to social security is to build a rights-based system founded on dignity, fairness and respect. In stark contrast to the UK government, whose ambition, whose abolition for the independent living fund and welfare reforms have already been internationally judged as delivering grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights. Housing has been described as the cornerstone of independent living. And yet, many houses are not designed or built to be homes for disabled people. 
So working with disabled people, local authorities and other housing providers, we will make sure that each local authority sets a realistic target within its local housing strategy for the delivery of wheelchair accessible housing across all tenures. And we will take a number of other steps to improve housing for disabled people, including carrying out research into creating tailor-made wheelchair accessible mass market homes and producing new guidance on timescales for installing adaptations. Stigma and discrimination continues to blight the lives of disabled people. And we agree with those who have called for a publicity campaign to tackle negative attitudes. And so I'm pleased to confirm that we will do that next year in 2017 as part of the One Scotland campaign. Presiding officer, one measure of how far we have come will be when disabled people are fairly represented in public life as our leaders and our elected politicians. Earlier this year, I announced the Access to Elected Office Fund, providing support for the 2017 local government elections. So I'm pleased that now we will maintain this fund so it is there for those who want to stand in the 2021 Scottish Parliament elections. Our shared goal is nothing less than for all disabled people to have choice and control, dignity and freedom to live the life they choose with the support they need to do so. The reason for that is simple. Equal rights for disabled people are about human rights and none of us can enjoy our human rights when even one of us doesn't. I commend A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People to the Parliament and I ask members across the Chamber to join us in committing Scotland's Parliament to giving full effect to the rights of all disabled people. As Dr Sally Witcher, Chief Executive of Inclusion Scotland, has said, the challenge now is to transform ambitions into actions that will, in turn, transform disabled people's lives and the country we live in. There is much to be done and no time to lose. I move the motion in my name. I now call on Adam Tompkins to speak to and move Amendment 2948.2. Um, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, I particularly welcome the fact that this debate is being signed, and I hope that that is uh, something that we can repeat much more often uh, in at this Parliament and indeed in public life in Scotland uh, more generally. There is much that I agree with in the uh, speech that we've just heard from the Minister. In fact, I think nearly all of it, apart from one or two uh, unnecessary sentences. Uh, I particularly and very strongly agree with what she has to say uh, about skills, about work uh, and, uh, and about transport. So let me start on this theme of where we uh, agree. We welcome the Scottish Government's Fairer Scotland Action Plan for Disabled People and we, and we agree by and large with the Scottish Government's stated ambitions for it. Like the Scottish Government, we want support services that promote independent living, that meet needs and enable a life of choices, opportunities and participation. Like the Scottish Government, we want decent incomes and fairer working lives for disabled people, as we do for able-bodied people. And like the Scottish Government, we want, we want places, we want workplaces, homes and transport that are fully uh, accessible. And like the Scottish Government, we want to see society do everything it can to ensure the fullest and most active participation in all aspects of public life, and indeed also of commercial life, of people with disabilities. And we Conservatives are proud of our long record of supporting and promoting people with disability. The Disability Discrimination Act of 1995, which the Minister mentioned, was passed, of course, under a Conservative government. William Hague described the passage of this legislation as his greatest political achievement. And who are we to disagree? As our amendment states, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give way to the uh, convener in a few moments. Uh, as our amendment uh, states, the Act has... Uh, long been regarded internationally as a model of effective anti-discrimination legislation. It went considerably further uh, than the non-discrimination legislation passed under Labour governments in the 1960s and 1970s, invaluable and essential though that legislation was in its day, in its requirements that reasonable adjustments be made by employers uh, and service providers. Happy to give away to Sandra White. Sandra White. I thank the member for taking intervention and hopefully continue on the agreement that you've already mentioned. Uh, do you agree then in the report of the UN which mentions the fact that uh, basically the UK government's treatment of disabled people has led to grave or systematic violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? 
Adam Tomkins. No, I don't, and I shall explain why in a few moments. Um, it's not a matter just of lawmaking, however. It's a matter also of public expenditure. And under the Conservatives, the United Kingdom spends £6 billion more per year on benefits for people with disabilities and health conditions than it did when we came to power in 2010. That is to say, under the Conservatives, the United Kingdom spends more on disabled people and people with health conditions than the OECD average, more than France, more than Germany, and more than the US. I'd like to point out, too, that the UK has an internationally leading record when it comes to supporting the rights of disabled people elsewhere in the world. Last year, for example, DFID, the Department for International Development, collaborated with International Disability Alliance to create the Global Action on Disability Group with the aim of stimulating further action on disability inclusion. Unfortunately, little of this was recognised in the recent report that Sandra White just referred to of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is referred to today in the government's motion. This is an exceptionally poor quality report, riddled with error and misunderstanding. It's mistaken. I don't know why members seem to think this is humorous. It's mistaken about the public sector equality duty. It's wrong about legal aid. It misunderstands, it misunderstands hate crimes and it gets the Care Act 2014 badly wrong. All of this is set out in detail in the UK Government's comprehensive response to the UN Committee's report. And this is unfortunate, since the United Kingdom strongly supported the development of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and was among the first countries to sign it in 2007. And as our amendment today makes plain, the Convention is aligned with the UK approach to disability equality, which focuses on inclusion and mainstreaming. Which brings me to work and employability, a section of the Minister's speech that I particularly welcome and, if I may, without doing either of our political careers damage, endorse. It is one of the great success stories of modern Britain, modern Conservative Britain, that we now have more jobs in the British economy than ever before. We have more women in employment than ever before. We have more people with disabilities in employment than ever before. Nearly half a million more since 2013 and 360,000 more than just two years ago. Despite this progress, however, employment rates amongst disabled people continue to reveal what the UK government recently called one of the most significant inequalities in the United Kingdom today. Only 48% of disabled people are in employment in the UK, compared with 80% of the non-disabled population. And the figures are even worse in Scotland. Now, I want to develop the point, if I may. Uh, the figures are even worse in Scotland, where the disability employment rate is a shocking 42%. This is an injustice, Deputy Presiding Officer, and that is why the Conservatives have a long-standing commitment to halve the disability employment gap. Yesterday at question time, the Minister for Social Security said that this is now Scottish Government policy too, and I welcome that. Yet another Conservative policy copied and borrowed by the SNP. See, they don't do, they don't do everything wrong. They don't do everything wrong. Yes. Jean Freeman. Will Mr Tompkins acknowledge what I also said yesterday, which was the Westminster Cross-Party Working Group's assessment of how long it would take the UK Government to meet that target of having the uh, employability gap on the basis of its current actions, which it says will take it till 2065. And will the member therefore agree with the actions proposed by that cross-party group as actions that the UK government should address with uh, some speed? Adam Tompkins. I, I do agree that it is taking too long to close the employability, the disability employment gap, and that is why our amendment welcomes not only the Scottish Government's fairer Scotland action plan, but also the UK Government's recent green paper on work, health and disability, which addresses a number of these points uh, head on. Article 27 of the aforementioned UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities recognises the importance of work and the dignity, fairness and respect that comes with it. The UK's commitment to this is underscored by the new approach set out in the Green Paper, which I think addresses a number of the concerns that the Minister just raised, illustrated, for example, by the establishment of the new Work and Health Unit. Like the Scottish Government's action plan, the Green Paper was developed in collaboration with disabled people. Among its features are the following. Significant support for people with disabilities or health conditions in the form of a new personal support package. Reform of the current schemes supporting employers and plans to increase access to psychological therapies and to more than double the number of employment advisors in these services. There's increased funding for those with mental health conditions. There's increased assistance for small employers, providing in-work support, advice on disability issues and workplace adaptations, as well as 
additional funding. And these are measures which we need to see across the whole of the UK, including in Scotland. And the United Kingdom and Scottish governments can, and in my view, should work in harmony together to provide and to facilitate this support. And for these reasons, Deputy Presiding Officer, I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move amendment 2948.1. Up there, uh, seven minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, and uh, thank you to your good office and the corporate body for again making this Parliament an exemplar of access to people who are deaf and use British Sign Language and carrying on the good work from the last par parliamentary session. Um, we support the publication of uh, Fairer Scotland for Disabled People and the Five Key Ambitions. Um, we feel that they reflect some of the commitments we made during the election campaign to disabled people. And that included promises to enhance their ability and freedom to work or set up a business, to get more involved in civic life, to ensure they can access justice, in particular when they're a victim of hate crime, and to make sure public services, in particular education, the NHS and transport are truly accessible. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation just released a report showing that while Scotland has the lowest poverty rate in the UK, there is still a massive 960,000 people living below the poverty line, and it has provided shocking detail on the poverty faced by disabled people. In particular, 26% of people in poverty in Scotland are disabled, the second highest rate in the UK after the North East of England. Um, they have said that across the UK, modern poverty is also increasingly linked with disability. And due to the higher costs of being disabled, half of people in poverty are either themselves disabled or are living with a disabled person in their household. And Disability Alliance Scotland built on that assessment, saying that 39% of people in poverty live in a household with at least one disabled person and that costs associated with a disability average at around 500 and fifty pounds per month. Now a key thrust um, and ambition of the delivery plan is to provide decent incomes and fairer working lives and we absolutely support that. In November it was announced that Scottish Government control of welfare powers, including disabil disability benefits, will not happen until twenty twenty. And those powers will give us the chance to restore dignity and respect to the heart of the social security system. And during that time, the Tories will continue to make their savage cuts and the most vulnerable will continue to suffer. And in a letter to the Social Security Committee, the Cabinet Secretary said, for so long as executive competence remains reserved, the UK has the ability to administer the existing benefits and to adjust the detail of their delivery. And just now, the UK Government is moving disabled people from disability living allowance to personal independence payments, which will lead to Scots losing a collective £190 million a year, according to Sheffield Hallam University research. In the Social Security debate last month, we revealed that up to 150,000 people in Scotland currently on DLA remain at risk of going through the new PIP assessment process. And so long as these powers stay with Westminster, we can't stop those PIP reassessments taking place and we can't meet the calls of the Stop PIP campaign. During that debate last month, Alison Johnson called on the Scottish Government to ask the UK Government to halt reassessments in Scotland. And we support that call to protect up to 150,000 DLA recipients. So our ministers should use their next meeting with the joint ministerial working group or individual meetings with DWP ministers to make that call. I think until those powers are devolved or until changes are made, until those changes can be halted, then the Tories will continue to make their cuts and the most vulnerable will continue to suffer. And rightly, expectation is building once again that we'll take different choices to alleviate that suffering, it building in the light of the challenges still faced by disabled people.
people challenges which campaigners are fighting against every day. Campaigners who will be watching closely how we approach those new powers. Um, it's an expectation not just for those directly affected by the powers, but for the country as a whole. An expectation of a system that doesn't tie disabled people up in red tape. An expectation of a system that preserves people's independence and provides not just that safety net to allow them to survive, but a springboard to playing a full part in society. An expectation of a system which moves us beyond the idea of social protection. A social security system which many people in Scotland just can't wait for. And I said earlier that one of our priorities for disabled people was to ensure that they can access justice, in particular when they are a victim of hate crime. One in five people in Scotland live with a disability, but they also live with prejudice and discrimination. This plan is a start. It's a good start, one we support, and the Scottish Government must now deliver its promises, build on them, and cut through the discrimination that people face. Since 2010, hate crime towards disabled people has trebled, an increase of 319% in six years. The legislation for the newer categories of hate crime came into force on the 24th of March 2010. Uh, that legislation was put forward by Patrick Harvey and gained cross-party support when it was introduced. Disability Alliance Scotland are calling for the Scottish Government to fund a significant national campaign to raise awareness of disability and to reduce stigma and discrimination, including education and training and the necessary evaluation. Parliament passed an amendment last month which proposed a zero tolerance approach to hate crime across Scotland. I think that's a good opportunity to commit to action today and I welcome what the Minister has said in the opening speech in committing to that necessary um, awareness raising campaign to tackle stigma and discrimination. Uh, President Officer, we support the Government's ambitions for a fairer Scotland for disabled people and simply ask members to recognise that the new Scottish social security system will be a vital tool to ensure disabled people have independence, decent incomes and fairer working lives. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We now move to the open speeches. Speeches of around six minutes, please. And I do have some time in hand, so I can give extra time for interventions or if anyone has something very special that has to be said. And uh, I would ask George Adam, please, to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, presiding officer. And it's nice to know I've got a little bit of time today. Uh, I welcome this debate and I'm glad to, to be taking part in it. Many of you will be aware that my wife Stacey has multiple sclerosis and as such has mobility issues. And because of this and her day-to-day -day struggle with access, I'm aware of some of the issues that disabled people face in Scotland. And the Minister Jean Freeman is correct when she says that disability isn't the problem. The barriers that we put up for disabled people are the actual problem. And during my time as a councillor in Remshire Council, I also became a member, and I still am to this day, of the Remshire Access Panel. And during, so much so that uh, I became involved in the national uh, campaign and became the patron of the Scottish Disability Equalities Forum, which is a national forum for all uh, Scotland's access forums. Now, until you have a disability or are a member of a family with one, you are completely unaware of the many challenges and barriers that disabled people face. I remember a Disability Awareness Day I attended in Paisley Town Hall many years ago. They asked us to either use a wheelchair or a specially designed pair of glasses that gave you an example of how it would be with a visual impairment. We then uh, progressed over from the Town Hall to Renfrewshire House to see how it was to access services in the council building. I was stuck with the visual impairment glasses and I was shocked to see how difficult it was to access the building. I had difficulty with the depth of pre pre uh, perception on the actual stairs. Uh, there was also a situation where I stood at the, one of the information monitors and the council had never expected a visually impaired person to be six foot three because I banged my head off of a monitor because I was unaware of it and couldn't see it. Now, the whole idea was, this was myself and the then provost Celia Lawson that did this. 
and everything was changed. But not in 21st century Scotland, that shouldn't be the case. That we should be able to make sure that disabled people get that access to all buildings whenever we can. And that's why I welcome the Scottish Government's disability delivery plan and applaud its ambitions. Because the key ambitions are that the support services that promote independent living, meet needs and work together to enable life choices, opportunity and participation. That gives us a start to make sure that people do get involved in public life in general. And two, to ensure that there are decent incomes, fairer working lives, make sure disabled people can enjoy full participation with an adequate income and participate in learning. And three, places that are accessible to everyone, one that we really need to work on. Housing and transport and wider environment are fully accessible to enable disabled people to participate as full and equal citizens. And four, protect the rights of all disabled people. And five, active participation. Disabled people getting the opportunity to participate actively as citizens in all aspects of life in Scotland. All of these ambitions can and should make a difference in the lives of disabled people in Scotland. Susan McGinley, disabled person and member of the Glasgow Disability Alliance, Drivers for Change, said, the Scottish Government disability plan is much needed and the particular commitments uh, around both establishing a strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness and fund opportunities for disabled people to volunteer are backed by thousands. She continued, I firmly believe that with the right support and connections, we can make our important contributions. And that is what this debate, I believe, is all about. The right support and uh, contributions so that Scots with a disability can make that contribution in life in Scotland. That support can take many guises, such as access to transport. Stacey and I have been at the other end of various public transport journeys from hell. We need to ensure that people with disability get the support they need to be able to access employment, volunteer and social activities. That's why I welcome the government's commitment to accessible travel framework in particular, which is action number 66. To the idea to create and develop an accessible travel hub, scope requirements for training with disabled people and transport providers and operators. You have no idea, presiding officer, how that would be a simple case that would be easy to do and would make it so much easier for people and families living with disability. And specifying agreed common standards for, of service for disabled people if their public transport journeys are disrupted and produce information about bus layout designs which improve accessibility. That's another example, presiding officer, of where we have to make sure, because it's almost like when you have a mobility issue, it's almost like Normandy D-Day landing when you want to go out, uh, organise a night out, and you have to make sure and the individuals have to be confident that the facilities are there for them as well. But Morvan Brooks, the CEO of Scottish Disability Equality Forum, stated, accessibility, trans accessible transport is vital to disabled people being able to enjoy the rights as citizens of a fair society. So this is all a step in the right direction. And the important point to make is this delivery plan is based on a social model of disability. Unlike the medical model, where an individual is understood to be disabled by their impairment, the social model views disability as the relationship between the individual and society. This delivery plan recognises the human rights of disabled people and must underpin all of our activities across a whole range of policy and legislation which affects disabled people. The Law Society of Scotland praises the Scottish Government for this, for taking a groundbreaking approach. And incidentally, on the uh, Conservative amendment, it is quite telling that they have dropped everything to me that mentions human rights. So, presiding officer, this, uh, the whole point of this debate is the main differences between the ideologies of the Scottish Government and those of the UK government. While here in Scotland we try and find a better way forward for our people, uh, the government in Westminster continues to pursue its failed austerity agenda and do not care whose lives they destroy in the process. For me, presiding officer, this is about standing up for people in Scotland, disabled people in Scotland, and making it forward and protecting them from the, the, the dark cloud of Westminster and their attack on the disabled. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Jeremy Balfour, called Jeremy Balfour, to be followed by Kate Forbes. Mr. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I apologise to you and to the Minister for arriving slightly late. Uh, nothing to do with disability, I just can't read a watch. Um, since I was elected to the Scottish Parliament in May, I met a number of disabled groups. All the groups have identified the same three priorities. Firstly, removing the stigma associated with disability. Secondly, preventing bullying. 
and thirdly, getting more people with disability into an employment. And thus, I welcome the government's delivery plan aimed at improving employment of disability people, particularly young disabled people, especially as our record here in Scotland isn't particularly good. Since 2008, the proportion of Scottish working age disabled people in employment has actually fallen from 49% to 42%. Just 2% of the working age disabled people in Scotland get support from access to work, proportionally a lot less than the rest of the UK. Now, there are many reasons for that. One of them, I suspect, goes back to education. Uh, I attended, uh, along with other members, uh, this, at lunchtime, um, a, uh, a, a briefing in regard to mainstreaming at school. And the clear message that came out of that was that mainstreaming doesn't mean inclusion. And we need to make sure that if we are going to follow a policy of mainstreaming for most people with disability, that that includes everything in regard to the education experience. After one year, school leavers with impairment related additional support needs are more than twice as likely to be unemployed as workless through with no additional support needs. Although disabled people make up 11.6% of all 16 to 24-year-olds, only 3.9% of modern apprenticeships went to disabled people. That needs to change, and it needs to change quickly, I would suggest. My experience of meeting individuals with a disability is that many of them do want to work, but cannot find employment. Studies show that work is good for your health, gives you financial reward, self-esteem, companionship, and a sense of purpose. Further evidence suggests that participating in, in internship schemes improves your future hopeful employment areas. For example, 10 of the 12 disabled graduates who participated in the Scottish Parliament internment scheme run by Inclusion Scotland moved into employment or full-time academic research. The findings of a report, Equal, Still Not, Why Not, published, published by Disability Agenda Scotland at the end of last month, identified that most people with a disability still experience stigma, prejudice, harassment and bullying in the workplace. Part of the report brought together case studies. Capability in their work group came across one individual who said this. I did a work placement and the first day the person I was sitting next to was asking me all sorts of questions, which was fine. The second day I went in, I was on my own and was told that I would have to sit beside myself because the woman sitting next to me had called me a spastic and she didn't want to work with a spastic or be close to someone like that. It's clear that here in Scotland, we have a long way to go in all areas. It's clear that all parties have to support efforts to raise awareness of disability, reduce stigma, discrimination, improve equality, and look at why discrimination is taking place. But can I suggest also Deputy Presiding Officer, that we have to look at what type of jobs disabled people are going into. I wonder, is there still a glass ceiling on certain jobs that simply aren't open to those with disability? Are there certain jobs people think disabled people should go into, rather than having a whole spectrum? And what kind of development do people have? I was talking again to a lady at lunchtime who'd been in the same job for 30 years, not because she wanted to, but she was scared to move on because there was no training for that. Disability comes in many different forms, and we need to make sure the appropriate training is there. I was pleased that earlier this week, the Scottish Parliament held disability equality training to help MSP researchers better engage with disabled constituents. And I think we, as parties and government, have to do more. As parties, we are underrepresented. If my maths is right, there should be 23 disabled people in this chamber having been elected. 
Now, clearly part of it is to do with the electorate on who they vote for, but are enough disabled people actually being given the opportunity to stand? Scotland has a vibrant and vocal disabled movement, and I think we should welcome that and encourage them as we seek to lobby us all. I hope that the outcomes of the Scottish Government Delivery Plan are felt not just in this Parliament, but more importantly, across the disabled community. It's good to have nice words from politicians, but what makes a difference is a job and a security and a purpose. And I wish it well and hope that that can be achieved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, call Kate Forbes. We followed by Alec Rowley. Ms Forbes, please. I'd also like to thank the hundreds of people who responded to the Fairer Scotland consultation. One of the most important lines in Jean Freeman's motion is the determination to continue to engage with disabled people as the experts in the continued actions that need to be taken to ensure that rights and independent living can be enjoyed. The Fairer Scotland report defines disadvantage not in terms of an individual's disability, but in terms of the barriers created by society. And I'd like to quote in full from the report. Unlike the medical model of disability, where an individual is understood to be disabled by their impairment, the social model views disability as the relationship between the individual and society. In other words, it sees the barriers created by society, such as negative attitudes towards disabled people and inaccessible buildings, transport and communication, as the cause of disadvantage and exclusion, rather than the impairment itself. The aim, then, is to remove the barriers that isolate, exclude and so disable the individual. And as the Minister said, disabilities are enormously varied and we are each unique. One policy for all is not the answer. But I welcome the Fairer Scotland report because its focus is on giving people the means and the opportunities to live as independently as possible and make their own choices. And in the spirit of celebrating uniqueness, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to tell you about my uncle, who works in a cafe and as a gardener. He's a St Johnston football club fan, probably their biggest fan. He goes to the football almost every Saturday and to ch church almost every Sunday. Throughout my childhood, the happiest parties I ever went to have been with him and his friends, and he recently celebrated his 50th birthday with a massive karaoke night with friends and family, including Tory MSP Alexander Stewart, who knows him very well. Though sadly for both of us, and I'll say this very, very quietly, he's a Labour supporter through and through and won't be persuaded to see the light. Every Christmas, he still dresses up as Santa and bestows presents on his nieces and nephews, which almost makes up for the fact that he spent most of the year telling us he was the boss and sitting in the front seat of the car. He's been an avid swimmer and horse rider in the past, and he lives on his own in a house in Perth with a small garden, and he has Down syndrome. And life works well. He makes the choices. Well, that is until his environment stops working. Recently, traffic works meant that the Pelican Crossing was out of action immediately outside his house, and life completely stopped for the simple but transformational reason that he couldn't cross the road. Work, football, shopping, visiting friends stopped. Independent living gone. Not because of who he is or what he can do, but because of a simple matter of traffic works. And whose fault is that? His or ours? We're all dependent in some way, some more obvious than others, some more freely admitted than others, but we must see people, not disabilities, each of us being unique. People then make community, and that community is all the richer, the happier, and the stronger for including people like my uncle. But real community is also the means of support to individuals. And I think this debate is about how our national community removes the barriers to independent living, opens up employment opportunities, improves accessibility to buildings and institutions, both the physical and the virtual, and promotes active participation. I'd like to briefly mention two ideas from the Fairer Scotland report, which I think provide great examples of doing just that. And they are based on the belief that the hurdle to participation is caused not 
by the disability, but the challenges of our environment. The first is the access to elected office fund, which aims to improve representation in democratic institutions by meeting the additional costs disabled people face when standing for election. And Jeremy Balfour has already made comment on that. The second is the forthcoming 2017 strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness, which promises to address the issues in forming and maintaining relationships, which many people can struggle with. A few weeks ago, an older gentleman who could not walk easily cycled into my office straight from the job centre. He was in a genuine state of shock that his income was being more than halved. But his fears were not about his bank balance, but about what that money meant. It meant a warm home. It meant transport to get out of the house and spend time with others. It meant the difference between more independence or more dependence, between having choices or not having choices, between participation in society or not participating in society. And the burden on us as representatives of this national community we call Scotland is to ensure that disabled people exercise choice, live independently and participate fully in society and that we do not put up the barriers that causes them to make a choice between any of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Forbes. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I would like to join the Minister in thanking everyone that has been involved in uh, the consultation and pulling together this document, which is, is um, as Mark said, we, we absolutely, Mark Griffin said, we absolutely support. Um, I think there needs to be a level of honesty um, from the Tory party in this parliament about the impact of welfare reforms on disabled people. I think it is, it is really important that if we have to be taken serious as politicians, and I, I take the point that Jeremy Balfour makes where he says that, that we need more than warm words for politicians, but if we have to be taken serious, then we've got to acknowledge the scale of the problem that's out there. And I do think Adam Tompkins does uh, the Tories in Scotland uh, no, no service when he's in complete denial about the impact to welfare reforms on disabled people. Um, the Disability Agenda Scotland sent through a brief for this event, uh, for this debate today. Well, let me, let me first um, uh, just say what the uh, Disability Agenda Scotland have to say about this. They say the changes to the social security system in recent years have undermined disabled people's right to live independently and their right to family life in controversial of Article 19 of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and Article 8 of the United Nations Convention on Human Rights. This affects disabled people, carers and others around them and the wider society and economy. Mr Tompkins. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. Will the member not accept the fact that £6 billion a year more is being spent on disability benefits in the United Kingdom now than was the case when the Labour Party were last in government. Mr Rowley. Well, you know, I just, I just heard from, from Kate Forbes here talk about the constituent that went into her constituency. I had um, a constituent that spoke to me just last week, along with his mother, and a constituent who, who has been suffering over a period of time and getting support from NHS 5 for mental health issues. And his benefits have been pooled as a result, and he's been told that he's fit for work. There are case after case after case. And so the evidence that you need to look at is the evidence that these organisations who are there to advocate on behalf or advocate on behalf of disabled people and support disabled people. You know, Adam Tompkins and Ruth Davison's Tories in Scotland can play around with, with who did what when they were in power. The fact is right now that the welfare reforms that are being the welfare reforms that are being um, 
put forward and brought into place by a Tory government are having a detrimental impact on disabled people uh, and, and others in Scotland. As Mark Griffin pointed out, the Joseph Rowntree uh, report, the foundation report that came out yesterday, and it's worth repeating what Mark Griffin said. He said that 26% of people in poverty in Scotland are disabled, the second highest rate in the UK. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation goes on to say modern poverty is also increasingly linked with disability. So if you are working hard in life, you're paying your taxes, you're getting on in life, and for whatever reason you become ill, uh, you're not able to, to continue to work in life, then be sure of one thing, this current Tory government will penalise you and will make you feel much worse, and in some cases drive you towards starvation. But if I could move, if I could move to, to the, the, the government itself and the issues that Inclusion Scotland raise. They talk about social care being part of an essential infrastructure that is required to enable disabled people to participate in family, community and economic life. But they go on to talk about cuts to social care packages, whether that is a result of the eligibility criteria uh, or, or reductions in, in, in services directly to people. And I think that that too is a key point. It is great to be able to have these strategies, and I commend everyone that's been involved in it. But the fact is that what we do need in Scotland is joined up government. And if we are seeing massive cuts taking place to local government, and as a result of that, health and social care packages being cut, and you begin to see health and social care packages being cut, because one of the, the first things when a budget's under pressure, presiding officer, is the eligibility criteria changes. And suddenly people who were eligible previously for the, the care packages are no longer eligible and that is one of the techniques that's, that's, that's used. Uh, but it does impact on people. Um, in terms of the area that I live in, I know that it's not just the numbers of people that are trying to get out of hospital, stud, currently standing around 90, being described as, as, as bed blotting, that are waiting for a care package. But there is massive waiting lists out there in terms of people waiting for assessments to actually get to the point of getting a care package. And then when they've assessed, there's another waiting list. So the fact is that our health and social care services are not being properly funded. Community care was never about care on the cheap. And I think the government, and I'm not doubting their commitment to being able to try and deliver this, but the government need to recognise that we need joined up uh, care, we need joined up government. And unless we fund health and social care, then there will be a massive gap there and disabled people will pay a higher price in terms of how that goes. The Inclusion Scotland also talk about, about care charges and that has been in many parts of Scotland one of the answers to the cuts in local authority budgets. I know that, that in Fife, uh, under, under um, the, the Minister's own party, they took uh, the, the home care charges and put them up for £4 a week to £11 an hour. When the next administration came in, which was, was, was with myself, we, we abolished the charges. But that's not true right across Scotland, yeah? John McAlpine. The intervention and um, I feel I'm concerned about care charges, which is why I spoke in the members' debate earlier this week. Um, you mentioned Fife Council. Are you aware that your colleagues who run the Fries and Galloway Council have um, uh, increased the threshold um, this year for uh, care charges from £132 a week um, down to £132 a week, even though they were given additional funding? Uh, by the Scottish Government, um, and that's no, under I'll the Labour to, administration. Uh, not another speech. Could, could it, I'm sorry, you're in your last minute, so you could finish in the next 30 no, seconds. I, I will. Can I just say to, to Joe McAlpine that, that, having served and been proud to serve as a Labour councillor over many years, the fact is that this year local councils across Scotland are facing a £500 million cut in their budgets. 
They will not be able to do that without looking right across services, and social care will take its, its, its share of that. That's why, if we're serious about this, serious about delivering, then we need to fund local services properly. And that would be my message. Labour stands alongside the SNP government. We want to work with you on this, but we need to fund local services. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. Call Sandra White to be followed by um, Alison Johnson. Miss White, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I just say that I, I really do welcome the publication of Affairs of Scotland for Disabled People, our delivery plan to give it its full title. Uh, I believe this plan will bring positive change for disabled people. The Scottish Government's goal for every disabled person to have choice, control, dignity and freedom which uh, reflects the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which we had raised earlier on with Mr Tomkins' uh, contributions. Uh, the plan marks the culmination of two and a half years' intensive engagement with disabled people and their organisations to establish their views and priorities. This work, led by Independent Living in Scotland Project, I believe they're called Inclusion Scotland now, worked with disabled people's organisations and through them engaged directly with disabled people to identify their priorities for action when it comes to making their human rights a reality. Now, can I just say, we did that. The Scottish Government engaged with these people. Uh, they listened to them and they took their thoughts forward in the consultation process that went ahead and obviously accumulating in the Fair of Scotland for disabled people. Unlike the UK Tory government, the SNP government are taking action, actually taking action to enhance the lives of disabled people. The Tories are violating their rights by punishing them with disproportionate welfare cuts. The ambitions around the five themes and 93 actions will support the ultimate aims of disabled people gaining their human rights. And if I can just make a couple of points, it's already been made by various other members. When the Tories talk about uh, sticking up for disabled people, you know, you'd really like to ask them, how is it that taking £30 a week, cutting from ESA, how will that help disabled people get into work? How will it help the DLA going over to PIP, taking £30, if you just let me finish, please, taking £30 a week off of disabled people going from DLA to PIP? How will that help disabled people? I'll take your intervention. Mr Tompkins. Sandra White for giving way. I, I wonder whether Sandra White would care to reflect on the fact that there are now 360,000 disabled people in work in the United Kingdom who were not in work uh, two years ago. Is that, an, is that not an achievement of a Conservative government or is that something else that you would like to condemn? You said, you said the word condemn, Mr Tompkins. Uh, I think you should speak to the disabled people. You'll see exactly who's been condemned by the UK government. And I'll go on to, I'll go on to explain that. Maybe you don't get these people at your constituency offices, but I certainly do. Young people and older people, £30 cut from DLA to PIP, who cannot work who cannot work, long-term disability. And if I could clarify, you talk about uh, Damien Green's green paper. Let's just clarify and remind ourselves of paragraph 114 of the consultation paper that went out that said people who are long-term disabled, who are in a certain category, can be mandatory assessed for work. Let's think about that. You don't tend to talk about that, do you, Mr Tompkins? I think it's about time disabled people know exactly, and the people of this country know exactly what the Tories are up to in this particular parliament and in the UK parliament as well. I'm going to go into something which I know that some of you actually were there. Geography. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that was I just a thank would, you smile. John Mason, please. I, I wonder if she would uh, agree that uh, cutting three out of four of the job centres in the east end of Glasgow is not going to help disabled people. Ms White. I, absolutely. Mr Mason is absolutely correct, as are others as well. How are they going to afford the transport? We've raised this issue before, but that's the caring, the caring supposedly Tory government for you in the UK and the people here are actually doing their work for them by actually promoting that as well. So I absolutely agree with you, Mr Mason, on that. I wanted to go into a performance that uh, I sponsored uh, in the Parliament just last week in a number. Annie Wells was there. A number of people were there, actually 11 MSPs turned up from all parties. It was absolutely fantastic. The Purple Poncho players are called. And uh, lots of say actually attend. The Minister also attended as, as well. Now, the performances were absolutely outstanding and they were hard hitting, but they were truthful. 
all performed by Glasgow, the GDA, Glasgow Disability Alliance, whose purple poncho was actually uh, born out of a shared experience at a march and rally in 2011. And they listened to disabled people's experiences. Uh, they got together and they created the purple poncho uh, people. Uh, the forms, as I said, it was, it was hard hitting. I'm reminding myself of what happened there. The scenarios they enacted were not figments of the player's imagination, and I'm sure Annie Wells can reflect uh, on that because Annie Wells was there and we spoke about it uh, later on. They were real life experiences. And it really was a damning indictment of how the UK government has systematically treated disabled people. Their performance was absolutely fantastic. It was individual experiences from these people who were told by the GDA if they could walk, even though people had uh, walking sticks, they couldn't walk uh, properly. How did you get here for an assessment? Uh, well, actually, I got the bus. Well, you're all right then. You're basically, you're fine, you can work. And that was then they were taken, taken off DLA. But the performances were absolutely fantastic. And I have to say, people... Okay, I'll take an intervention. Mr Balfour. How far does the member think you can't walk before you should get benefit? Where would she set it? Or would it be, what line does she draw? I really, uh, I re I really feel, I mean, perhaps if you, know, you were there, you saw, and I know a number of the, the Conservatives were there, but you know, to ask people how far you can walk, as people have said previously, people are kind of, one of the, the performances was people who had mental health problems. They may feel all right one day, but not necessarily the next. Because they felt all right that day, they were taken off a DLA. But here's the caring Tories once again. But what I want to say is I wholeheartedly support the approach that the Scottish Government is taking in involving disabled people and organisations in promoting and planning this strategy and listening. And this is a big problem with the Tories over there. They listen to nobody listening to the people on the ground, the disabled people who are going through this day in, day out. And if you looked at the figures of people who perhaps may be back at work, are forced back to work. I, I don't like to talk about people who have died or anything else. I'm not going to raise it in this chamber, but I can certainly send the figures to people who are sent back to work. And I'm talking thousands, not hundreds, who have died since they were taken off the DLA and told they were fit to work. You should get out in the real world, the Tories, and stop pontificating for the benches over there. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to follow by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Providing, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and to broadly welcome the government's A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People plan which lays out an ambitious approach to achieving disability equality. In the short time I have, I'd like to address some of the very positive recommendations that will help disabled people achieve economic security through employment and the benefits system, as well as highlighting how some of those might go further. With non-disabled people almost twice as likely as, as able people to be in work, and that figure barely changing in more than a decade, the government's aim to half the disability employment gap is welcome and couldn't be more urgently needed. And as a supporter of the One in Five campaign, which seeks to promote the involvement in public life of the 20% of Scots who experience a disability or health condition, I very much welcome the pledge to support new job opportunities for disabled people in politics and the third and public sectors. So many of the actions listed in the plan will come to fruition only when disabled people are properly represented at all levels of policy making. And so this is a positive step. And I would ask um, too that ministers consider whether 120 posts over four years is sufficient or whether we can be more ambitious. Perhaps this debate will, will serve to, to encourage interest. Um, and having stood on a manifesto pledge to increase opportunities for disabled people to access modern apprenticeships, I was really pleased to see actions 36 and 37 widen access to modern apprenticeships for disabled people and to pay them the highest rate of funding until the age of 30. Helping people with disabilities and health challenges to stay in work once they have found it is important too. And I'm glad to see this is recognised by the plan. As much as work can be a positive force in our lives, too many Scots work in jobs that don't promote healthy working practices or an appropriate work-life balance. And so we're faced with a significantly increasing number of people who leave work for health reasons, particularly poor mental health. So integrating health, disability and employment support in Scotland 
to ensure that people can stay in work is laudable and I look forward to working with the government to achieve this when the full devolved employability schemes begin to operate in 2018. Um, to Conservative colleagues who place a focus on keeping people in work, I would ask them perhaps to speak to their UK colleagues about the cuts to motability schemes as these have had a devastating impact on the ability of many to attend work. I would also like to question, however, whether the disability plan takes into account the broader economic transformation Scotland needs for all Scots, both disabled and non-disabled. We have an economy where too many jobs are low paid with highly variable hours that don't protect people from poverty. And disabled people are more likely to work in those jobs than non-disabled people. Halving the disability employment gap will not be the achievement that we all wish it to be if it's achieved by encouraging disabled people into work that doesn't offer the economic security that we would wish. The quality of all jobs must improve. And after years of slow but steady progress, the move towards equality for disabled people has gone into reverse in the past few years, particularly as a result of disability benefit cuts. These cuts, as the motion notes, have been criticised by the United Nations as a grave and systematic violation of disabled people's human rights. I accept that the Scottish Government recognises the terrible impact of these cuts and has made some positive first moves in response to them, stepping in to save the Independent Living Fund when it was axed by the UK Government has helped over 2,000 people and the proposed expansion will help many more. And implementing the Green Manifesto Pledge for a National Healthier Wealthier Children Project could, based on the evidence from the original scheme in Glasgow, help disabled parents and children access disability living allowance and personal independence payments. I am concerned that the disability plan doesn't demonstrate a clear strategy for responding to these cuts and the many more cuts still to come. By 2020, for example, 70,000 Scots will be losing up to £900 a year in cuts to employment and support allowance, and another 70,000 losing as much as £2,600 each in the move from DLA to PIP. I would welcome that the Scottish Government would take a clear position on whether it is willing to fully use the new devolved benefits and tax powers to mitigate the impacts of welfare cuts on disabled people. A fairer disability benefit system, which I have no doubt the Scottish Government seriously wishes to establish, must recognise that some of the users of that system will previously have lost thousands of pounds with negative impacts on their health, well-being and likelihood of being able to access employment. If it doesn't, the Scottish Government will be tacitly accepting the cuts. Deputy Presiding Officer, after years of cuts that have eroded the human rights of disabled people, a fairer Scotland for disabled people puts those rights at the heart of the strategy to create a more inclusive society. The plan to achieve this is appropriately ambitious, but the Scottish Government must recognise the weight of expectation disabled people will have because of that ambition and the dreadful extent to which some disabled people have suffered in recent years as a result of Westminster's welfare cuts. They will rightly be looking for bold, radical change. And if the Scottish Government is willing to pursue the plan it has laid out to the radical extent that is needed to achieve equality for disabled people, then it can be assured of Scottish Green support. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alec Cole-Hamilton to be followed by Claire Hockey. Mr. Mr. Cole-Hamilton, please. Thank, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Whilst I take many opportunities to offer this Scottish Government uh, robust criticism and honest scrutiny, uh, to try to score points in this debate would be to do a disservice to the tens of thousands of children, men, women and their families who look to us as legislators to work across these benches uh, to find a better quality of life and a better inclusion for people affected by disability in our society. In that spirit, can I take this opportunity to uh, thank the government for this debate and this excellent motion. Um, their work in the last session to reverse the iniquitous DLA takeaway, which saw uh, DLA suspended from families whose children went into hospital for 84 days or more, for the work they did to support carers in the most recent uh, Carers Act, and indeed in the nascent movement that they have taken in defining Scotland's new social security system, which is quite well, quite well deservedly gathering cross-party support. I also welcome the publication of A Fairer Scotland for Disabled 
uh, people, and with it, five recommendations, something that the Liberal Democrats are proud to actively support. I want to use my remarks uh, and my time today, presiding officer, to offer some reflections on at every stage of life's journey for families and children and, and adults affected by disability in our society. And obviously, that process begins with diagnosis. Now, many physical disabilities will be self-evident or, or clearly apparent at birth, but many others may take months years and sometimes even decades to un, uh, identify. Now I have raised a couple of times the case of Isla McKenzie, the schoolgirl in my constituency who took nearly a year to get a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. It was my great pleasure to finally meet Isla in this parliament yesterday at the cross party group on children and young people. But she is not alone and last week alone, I met with three different families at various stages in the diagnostic Jenny, who are still waiting for support and still struggling until they get a definitive answer as to what they can expect from the state. Enable Scotland uh, published evidence last year that it can take up to three years to obtain that diagnosis. Not even getting to the starting line means that we deprive a family and the ch children of access to support. And, uh, and even once that's been given, you would hope that various uh, sectors of society in whose gift statutory support is would helicopter up uh, with a suite of options and packages of help. But it's sometimes not that easy uh, either. And some health boards are better than others. We all know families who stunned and devastated by a diagnosis and wondering what life might have for them um, are, have been left in the wind and only by chance come upon state support. I know one family in particular who attended an appointment for treatment two and a half years after their daughter um, was diagnosed with a complex condition and a chance encounter with a family who had another child uh, with the same condition, only then did they realise that they were entitled to any form of support at all. I think we as a country are doing families like that a profound disservice if they are not even aware of the support that could be available to them. Even after a uh, diagnosis, families can face a brick wall of availability if they're in rural locations um, and depending on their living circumstances, Many may find it difficult to access respite care or struggle to obtain a care package they deserve if we're talking about traveling great distances to access support. All of these can be captured, I think, in what I hope uh, will be a prof profound movement towards uh, realising a strategy for families affected by disability. And it's a long time coming. In 2007, Aiming High for Disabled Children was a UK strategy that saw with it a consequential come north of nearly £40 million. But because of the presumption against ring fencing, that didn't make it to disabled children in Scotland and went into the local authority uh, expenditure. But I am grateful that 10 years later, we are now on the verge of this strategy. And I hope that it will encompass things like diagnosis, provision, transitions into adult services, and most importantly, inclusion. And with that, I mean inclusion in work and in learning. Um, and I'm also grateful, I should say, to the, the minister for her confirmation that it won't be restricted to families, but it will also cover children who are looked after or on supervision orders uh, who don't fit the normal definition of family support. Um, we also, in the last session, passed a very laudable act of social care in the Self-Directed Support Act. And, and my party absolutely supported that, and we still do. It is a very liberal and empowering agenda to give people and families choice over the care that is directed for them. But that has been met by challenges in its own respect. We still see um, some local authorities not applying it in the way that this parliament intended that it should be, that families not aware that they have four choices, four options available to them. Um, and indeed, in some cases where provision is patchy, we don't have the choice that we would have expected or hoped for the families to whom that act was extended. Uh, access to employment, we've heard a lot about in this debate, and I think it still remains a, one of the abiding challenges of our uh, parliament and our society that we still have so many hurdles for disabled people to cross before they enter the workplace. In 2011, a major metropolitan local authority in this country published an outcome in its single outcome agreement, which said that um, it wanted 200 16 to 17 year olds who had a disability in the workplace a year later. A year later it reported on that and it had only achieved 11. Such is the crushing gap between rhetoric and reality in this agenda. We cannot rest on our laurels. We must work harder together. And then finally, in terms of end of life provision and working with those families affected by life limiting conditions, we want to see parity between child and adult hospice care. And also as the uh, Scottish government takes 
administration over the DS1500, ensuring that there is no arbitrary cutoff as to when patients with terminal conditions can access disability benefits. Presiding officer, I'll finish with this. Our disabled citizens are our friends, our neighbours, our family members, our colleagues. They are part of the rich diversity that makes Scotland great. They have so much to offer, and we in this place must work together to make sure there is nothing in their way to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I call Claire Hockey, followed by Miles Briggs. Ms. Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would firstly like to welcome and commend the Scottish Government's delivery plan for creating a fairer Scotland for disabled people. I believe that this gives us a comprehensive blueprint for the work to be undertaken over the next five years to ensure that we remove the barriers that can often exclude disabled people from living as independently as possible. There are many commendable points in the plan, and I welcome in particular the undertaking set out in the section on decent incomes and fairer working lives. The right to work is as important to a person with a disability as to those who are not disabled, and yet only about half of those who are of working age are in work, compared with 80% of non-disabled people of working age. There are still too many barriers to employment for people with disability, and I am pleased to see that targets will be set to increase the numbers of people with a disability employed in public sector workplaces. Alongside a work experience scheme for young disabled people, helping them to adjust when they find work, there will be employability programmes to help people into a job and a social enterprise strategy to help disabled people set up their own businesses. We must do all we can to ensure that the barriers currently in their paths are removed for those who can and want to work. But what of those who cannot work? How should we treat our fellow citizens who are unable to work, whether for prolonged periods or not at all? The motion before us notes that the welfare cuts of the UK government have led the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to conclude that there have been grave and systemic violations of disabled people's human rights. How we design our social security system to ensure that it supports rather than condemns will define the kind of society we aspire to be. Presiding officer, I would like to give an example of the kind of social security system we do not want. I was recently asked by a constituent and friend to accompany her to a PIP review meeting that she'd been unexpectedly asked to attend in Glasgow. My constituent is a lady who has a degenerative condition. She has multiple health problems, is on numerous medications and under the care of several hospital consultants, physiotherapy and podiatry, as well as regular GP contact. And she's also currently awaiting surgery. Despite her not being due for a PIP review until September 2017, she'd received a text message asking her to call the DWP. She was asked questions about her illness and whether her conditions had deteriorated or improved. Following this telephone call, she was asked to attend a review. She's currently 12 months into a two-year award. No reason was given for why she was being interviewed early. We arrived at the office 25 minutes early as my constituent was worried she would be sanctioned if she was late. Our appointment was at 1pm. However, by 1.15, she'd still not been called. The manner of the receptionist to a polite inquiry from myself about the delay was brisk, cold and verging on hostile. It became very apparent I shouldn't be making such an inquiry. I was informed that the reviewer would be reading, any, uh, would be reading my constituents' notes and that this can sometimes take some time depending on the complexity of her condition. This begs the question, if notes need to be read prior to appointments, why not schedule appointments for later? Less time waiting in a, a reception might alleviate some of the anxiety those called for review experience. At 1.20, we were collected by, uh, at reception by the reviewer. There was little explanation of the process and the reviewer had no idea why my constituent had been called in early. Her attitude was definitely one of, prove to me you're unfit. As the interview progressed and the complexity of the disability my constituent lives with became more apparent, the reviewer's attitude changed dramatically. She became more empathetic in her questioning, her body language changed, as did the tone of her voice. And I was quite taken aback by this discernible change. My constituents' conditions are well documented. Consultants and healthcare professional reports are held by the DWP and had apparently just been read by the reviewer. So why were these comprehensive notes and assessments evidently not believed? Why did she have to demonstrate her disability? 
Why did she have to disclose very personal and intimate details about her conditions to a stranger when the medical evidence had already been submitted to the DWP? Does the DWP think healthcare professionals lie or exaggerate in the reports and letters? Do they not trust their clinical judgment? Throughout the interview, the reviewer typed information into a form on the computer. My constituent had no way of checking if the information recorded was accurate. She wasn't shown what was recorded and it wasn't read back to her to verify. Remember, this information will decide if she continues to receive benefit or not. This can be the difference between her having some quality of life or merely existing. Mistakes in recording information can be made. Information can be misheard or misunderstood. The wrong box can be inadvertently ticked. In no other situation would this occur. If, for example, you made a statement to the police, you would get to check it and sign that the information had been recorded accurately. My constituent is a very forthright and assertive lady, but she was cowed and disempowered by this process. She felt unable to speak up for herself as the balance of power was definitely against her. Her fear was that by questioning or challenging anything during the review, she would be treated less favourably. She cannot afford to lose her PIP payments. After the review, when I fed back to her my experience and concerns, she became tearful. She was so relieved I had witnessed the same as she had and that her perception of what had happened was validated. But more concerning though, was that she informed me that the review had been much better than the last one, which she'd attended alone. At that review, she felt the, the reviewer was openly hostile and had treated her with a complete lack of respect. I can honestly say, presiding officer, it was one of the most eye-opening experiences I've had for quite some time. We in Scotland can do so much better than this. Whether it is ensuring that people can enjoy fairer working lives or where working is not an option, providing fair and appropriate support to enable them to live as independently as possible. We must ensure that dignity, respect and inclusion are at the heart of what we deliver through this plan. By continuing to engage with disabled people, we can better understand the challenges and barriers they continue to face. The government's plan for creating a fairer Scotland for disabled people seeks to tear down those barriers and deliver a society where every citizen is valued and their rights are fully recognised. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr Briggs, you are the penultimate speaker. I say this in hope. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in today's debate. All of us in this chamber can agree with the Scottish Government's key aim of ensuring disabled people have the same equality and rights as non-disabled people. The challenge for the Government and for all of us as elected representatives is to remove the practical barriers that can often be put in place for disabled people and allow them to have the same opportunities as all other citizens in Scotland in order to realise their potential. I also agree with the Minister that the direct involvement of disabled people is essential as it takes forward its delivery plan. Their views and input must be sought every step of the way. Accessibility is rightly a key theme in the delivery plan and accessibility to transport for disabled people has been an issue I've been campaigning and working on with Lothian constituents since my election, specifically in relation to access to Waverley Station. I commend the Edinburgh Access Panel for the efforts that they've made in campaigning to improve the current inadequate pick-up and drop-up arrangements at Waverley Station. And I have to say that for two years since taxis were banned from the station, disabled people in Edinburgh feel they've been effectively made second-class citizens when accessing Waverley Station. This is totally unacceptable and must be addressed at the earliest opportunity. I believe operators may have broken disability discrimination legislation and I hope in responding that the Scottish Government and the Minister will outline whether or not they would agree to look into this. I recently held a members debate on this issue and I look forward to meeting with constituents and the Transport Minister Hamza Youssef at the station in the new year. From the headlines I've read this week he may also be using Waverley Station more often in the future. <laughs> and I will... I will continue to do all I can to support constituents to achieve a more accessible station for blind and disabled people. Deputy Presiding Officer, as has been mentioned, reducing barriers to employment is critically important. I think we heard a first class speech from my Lothian co colleague, Jeremy Balfour, and that hopefully this plan can work to smash any glass ceiling faced by disabled people access employment in Scotland today. 
Disabled people have so much to offer employers, and if employers are able to make reasonable adjustments, can allow them to join the workforce. The fact that disability employment rate in Scotland is lower than the rest of the UK is something we have to address. And I welcome the comments the Minister has made on apprenticeships and business start-up schemes. Good work is already being done in my region by a number of third sector organisations, both local and national, including All, All in Edinburgh Service and Remploy. Their efforts are to be commended and there are some real success stories based on support being provided to disabled people, both to find employment and to receive ongoing continued guidance and assistance while in employment. More widely, I'd like to pay tribute to the many voluntary organisations in my region who work with and on behalf of disabled people. Their work is immensely important to people and the volunteers who help these organisations do so much to improve the quality of life and are to be commended. Kate Forbes isn't in the chamber at the moment, but I thought she made a, a very good contribution. And actually, I hope the delivery plan should also look at access to sport, both for disabled people to watch um, and also to take part. My colleague Adam Tompkins talked about mental health, and as my party spokesman, I'd like to back up the comments he made. Next week, Scottish Conservatives will publish a new mental health policy statement with a broad range of detailed policy proposals that I believe can help people with mental health challenges and inform the Scottish Government's forthcoming new mental health strategy. And it's important, it's important that the Government's disability and delivery plan aims to support those whose lives are affected by mental health disabilities, as well as physical, physical challenges. It's disappointing that the Scottish Government's motion for today's debate, which is, after all, about its own delivery plan, includes the now obligatory attack on the UK Government. And I'd suggest to the Government that it might be better actually focusing on the areas where it has direct responsibility and could make a difference to people's lives. If SNP ministers are trying to build consensus on this issue in Parliament, they seem to be going about it in the wrong way. Alex Cole Hamilton um, mentioned palliative care, and I'm pleased that Scottish Conservative pressure on this has meant that the Scottish Government has now agreed to deliver parity for palliative care between children and adults. Earlier this week, I also met with a number of young constituents with severe physical disabilities who have to pay for their social care and who want to see the Scottish Government look at how they can better support them. On Tuesday evening, the Cabinet Secretary for Health agreed to my request to widen the feasibility study into extending free social care for dementia sufferers under 65 to consider those under 65 who also have terminal illnesses. Young disabled people who do not have a terminal health condition but life-limiting ones would also like to have a debate about this and see how they could benefit. And I hope we can have these discussions as the government looks to improve care packages and set up its independent living fund. To conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome today's debate and look forward to the practical improvements disabled people want to see being delivered by this government. I support the amendment in my colleague Adam Tompkins' name. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. I call Joan McAlpine, who is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms McAlpine, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to support the motion today. There are a million people with disabilities living in our country, Scotland, and the delivery plan recognises that the human rights of disabled people underpin, uh, all of it, should underpin all of our activity across a whole range of policy and legislation. Uh, I want to endorse... Um, what Alec uh, Rowley and others have said uh, about uh, the UK benefits uh, changes um, under the Conservative government. And I, I don't think that we should uh, avoid um, pointing out the problems that these have caused to disabled people. Welfare reforms, um, uh, we, they touch on our direct experience as MSPs. And if the Tories benches don't recognise that, then perhaps people... Uh, whose disability benefits have been cut altogether don't go to their Tory MSP as a first port of call. Um, but they can perhaps learn a little if they, if they turn uh, to a blog run by one of my constituents, uh, Mark Franklin, uh, who operates the First Base Food Bank in Dumfries. Um, he told the story in his blog of a man he called Donald, which was not his real name, who came to First Base looking for a food parcel uh, because he had received an 86-day benefit sanction. Uh, now, Donald had learning difficulties. Uh, he asked for a non-cooking uh, parcel, and that's because uh, he had no money uh, to pay his electricity bills. We couldn't cook. 
Um, he had no heat and light in the middle of winter and he had learning disabilities. Um, Mark Franklin was so worried about Donald that he started a crowdfunder to pay his £160 electricity bill. And with a few, within a few hours, uh, Mark had, uh, had raised much more than the £160. The funds now reached uh, £6,000 at the last count. So Donald will have his electricity bill paid and the extra money, uh, Mark says, will help other Donalds. And sadly, there are too many other Donalds. Uh, the report into sanctions conducted by the Welfare Reform Committee in the last Scottish Parliament uh, took considerable ev evidence of sanctions against disabled people. Uh, I sat on that committee and we went on to take evidence on the shape of the future social security system, um, which of course uh, will largely affect uh, people receiving disability benefits. And, and to uh, address the point that uh, Mark Griffin made earlier, I, I recall very clearly uh, at, at that time, shortly after the Smith Commission, uh, the minister at the time, Alec Neil, asking for uh, the PIP not to be rolled out in Scotland. And I certainly remember us questioning the Scottish Secretary in committee at the time and asking that the uh, that PIP was not rolled out since these benefits were being uh, devolved to us, but the point blank refused to consider that then as they are doing now. Um, I wanted to raise another point, um, which is perhaps a little bit more controversial, which disability groups raised with us in, in committee when we were talking about designing uh, the new social security system, and they were absolutely opposed to the new social security system being, uh, being devolved to local authorities, which is what some politicians wanted. And I seem to remember quite vividly in taking that evidence that they said that that would equate to the, the parish system, the old parochial system that preceded uh, the welfare state. So they warmly welcomed the Scottish Government's decision to set up a, a national system, which is what the Minister is doing. And I think it's, it's excellent that she is taking the time to consult carefully uh, with the people who will be using that system so that she gets it right. Because the reason why these disability groups uh, were so opposed to local authorities having control of the, the new social security system was because of their experience uh, with local authorities in the provision of services at the moment. They simply didn't trust councils uh, to protect them because they had too many negative experiences. And I'm sure there's lots of good examples in councils where they are doing things right, but this certainly, in my experience of dealing with constituents with disabilities um, and also listening to these groups, there's clearly a problem at local authority level with the way uh, you know, some uh, disability services are delivered. Um, now, Alec Rowley raised the issues of charges earlier. Um, I can't see how these charges are commensurate with human rights. Uh, and while Alec Rowley said it was a financial issue, and I would point out these, as he knows, these cuts are coming uh, from the UK government and local authorities are receiving the same level of cuts as the Scottish government's receiving from London. But the, 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 I don't think this is just a financial issue because that doesn't explain why these charges uh, for home care vary across local authorities and, as he said himself, vary from administration to administration. Uh, thank you. So thank sorry, you. Mr Rowley. Alex Rowley. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to Joan McAlpin for giving away given way. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the cuts that are coming through Westminster, the fact is that as well as having social security powers in this parliament, we have other powers. Would she agree that many people out there are saying that what will this parliament do, despite the, the failed austerity Tories in, in here, what will the Scottish parliament do and would, should we use the powers to invest in these services? John McAlpin. As I mentioned during the debate on co home care um, this week to his colleague Colin Smith, who's in the, the council that's uh, hiked up the charges most in Scotland and in Dumfries and Galloway, I mean, there are choices within local authorities. And for example, they are creating a whole new layer of bureaucracy called uh, ward support workers who are not frontline staff and who are there to, to support councillors. Uh, so, you know, I think there are choices within local authorities uh, about the way that they do things. Um, the charges themselves, I mean, to get back to the, the point in hand, um, are starting in some cases at 
£100 per week, which is the COSLA minimum, that threshold. And we should, I wanted to point out that the income tax isn't levelled on people at £132 per week. Uh, so I don't see why disabled people should be penalised uh, in that way. Um, so I'm pleased that the government is reviewing uh, these, uh, the charges and, and actually extending its uh, review in terms of I know that it's looking at the charges to people who suffer from dementia, uh, who are under uh, 65. I personally think it shouldn't just be, um, as Miles Briggs uh, raised, people with terminal illnesses. I think all disabled people um, uh, I think should come into the review um, because many of the people, many of the people affected are the most vulnerable people uh, in society. Um, and to, I also wanted to just reflect on the points that have been raised about um, self-directed support. Um, I, again, the way some local authorities are administering it is very worrying. For example, in Dumfries and Galloway, people are given cards and their accounts are monitored very closely uh, by council officers. They're not allowed to build up too much of a balance, so that means that they can't plan ahead to pay for respite and family holidays. And I don't think that was the intention of self-directed support when this parliament passed it. I think the idea was to empower people. So I think, I, I believe um, that SPICE is doing a bit of work on self-directed support so, uh, and how it's rolled out across local you authorities. You must close now, please, um, Ms. McAlpin. I'll look forward to, um, to, to reading that when it comes out. Thanks very much. I move now to the closing speeches, and I call on Pauline McNeill. Around six minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Presiding officer, one million people in Scotland live with a disability, and because of that, they often live with prejudice, discrimination, and attitudes which serve to marginalise them, making their lives more difficult than they need to be. And of course, as we all agree, they are people first. But it is time to make serious and long-lasting inroads into changing attitudes and creating equality for that one million plus group. I welcome the fact that we are discussing the delivery plan today. And in my opinion, it is the area of equality in which we have the most to do in this parliament. But I do believe, as others have said, that UK welfare reforms affecting hundreds and thousands of disabled people across Scotland was a very serious setback to this agenda. I think Claire Hawkey spoke eloquently about her constituent, how disempowered that she felt in her experience, the hostility that she felt, and ultimately the lack of respect. Sad to say, I don't think it's a case sitting on its own. But the UK has been a signature to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Disabled People of Disabled People since 2007. And yes, there are many things to commend the UK government for doing in relation to disabled people. However, I do think that it is important to document in the debate today some of the detail of the UN report based on an 11-day inquiry into, in 2015 that reported that austerity policies introduced into the welfare and social care amount to systematic violations of the rights of people with disabilities. It is also withering about the manner in which ministers conducted those reforms. According to the report, the worst aspects of these actions contained therein is that the UK government pushed ahead even though they knew that it would have an adverse impact on disabled people. On page 26, the report says, the impact assessments conducted by the state party, that is the UK government, to the implementation of several measures of its welfare reform expressly foresaw an adverse impact on people with disabilities. It says the core elements of the rights to be independent living, be included in the community, an adequate standard of living and social protection, and the right to employment has been affected by recent policy changes. These changes have resulted in the restriction of disabled people's freedom of choice and control over their daily activities. If you make a 20% cut to welfare expenditure, then you must have some idea that it's going to have this kind of impact on the group who rely on them. The extra cost of disability has been ignored and income protection has been curtailed as a result of benefit cuts. While the expected goal of achieving decent and stable employment is far from being attained, the bedroom tax, 
cuts to personal independence payments, notorious fit-for-work tests that we've discussed in this Parliament many times, creating high levels of anxiety and stress. So it is a huge backward step, I believe, in the times that, that we live in, where we should have been able to build on the progress that had been made since the Convention of 2007 and the 1995 on discrimination against people with disabilities. Uh, and in setting our commitments to eradicating barriers to employment, um, I think there's been very important contributions this afternoon made by Miles Briggs and others about travelling and public transport. We know that we have a job here to fundally, fundamentally change people's attitudes to people with disabilities. Because the organisations that we've been hearing from who brief us on a regular basis are currently fighting too many rearguard actions, fighting for the most basic rights, the right to live and be supported by the welfare state. Alec Cole Hamilton and many others have talked about the disability delivery plan and its focus on young people. And I believe this is a very, very important area for the delivery plan. Young disabled people have a similar level of career aspiration at the age of 16 to their wider peer group. I mean, that gives us, I think, some optimism that at that age and stage in life, young people with disabilities have the same aspirations. But the sad thing about that is by the time they reach age 26, then they are nearly four times more likely to be unemployed according to Disability Agenda Scotland. As Jean Freeman, the minister says, this is where dreams are dashed and this is where a delivery plan must focus on ensuring that those dreams become real dreams for those young people. Amongst those who were in employment, earnings were 11% lower than they were for non-disabled counterparts with the same level of educational qualifications. That is no doubt quite a high level of discrimination in that group. The impact of young people's frustrated ambition becomes clear as they reach their 20s in terms of their confidence, uh, their subjective well-being and their belief in their ability to shape their own future. According to Inclusion Scotland, the plan's 93 actions still remain to be clearly defined in terms of who is and who is to do what and when. They say that the plan is helpful, but remore, more remains to be done to turn the delivery plan into something that we can implement it and monitor it. In conclusion, presiding officer, I know that we all agree that there's a much broader context for our work on disability discrimination. I wholeheartedly support the Minister's statement today that she will ensure that there is a public information campaign conducted by this government. In fact, in many ways, I think the most important aspect of the plan, because a public information campaign is designed to fundamentally tackle everyone else's attitudes, because without changing attitudes, we will not have done our job. The stigma, the discrimination faced by people with disabilities, from ordinary members of the general public, from health professionals, as we have been reading about in our briefs, and in fact, every level of service. We must do better at every level of service, every aspect of public transport. We must take decisive and progressive action in this parliamentary term, because we owe it to the one million plus people who look to us for action. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Sorry, my, my voice might be a bit croaky, but just bear with me. Um, um, I'd like to thank those who have already spoken in this debate today, and I would also like to thank everyone who participated in the consultation for the Social Security. It is in the interest of the million-plus disabled people who live and contribute to Scottish life that we deliver on this issue and reach some consensus on how best to do so. Whilst I recognise slamming the opposition as part and parcel of debate, the Scottish Government's motion misses the point. It may be an inconvenience for those who want to take every opportunity to damn and bury Westminster, but this kind of rhetoric is slowly becoming redundant. New welfare powers as part of the Scotland Bill are coming. 
The Scottish Parliament will have full control over the benefits associated with the extra costs of living with a disability. It will also have the ability to top up any reserved benefit it deems necessary, including employment support allowance. I would like to make some progress. Thank you. Maybe the motion should at least acknowledge that. Adam Tompkins, I believe, is right to stress the achievements of the UK Government's response to the UN report. The UK Government spends £50 billion a year on benefits supporting those with disabilities and health conditions, specifically. Will you just let me make some progress? I will take an intervention. Um, this figure has risen by £6 billion since 2010, and that is by no means insignificant. That's that is a near 14 per cent increase. I will take an intervention from Sandra White. Sandra White. I thank the member very much for taking the intervention. I just want to know if she agrees. You mentioned the UN report. Do you agree with uh, Mr Tompkins then that uh, basically he doesn't believe that the UN report was correct? Do you agree with that? Annie Wells. What I believe is that we can see that the UK government has put in £6 billion extra spend a year since 2010. A 14 per cent increase. We need to see that the UK government do take people with disabilities and health conditions seriously. We are spending £50 billion a year. Um, I don't think laughing is probably the right thing to do. Promoting the best opportunities in life for those living with disabilities. I actually just want to make some progress. Thank you, Mr Adams. Promoting the best opportunities in life Please for those down, living Mr. Adam. with disabilities should not solely focus on welfare, however. Welfare, health, education, employment all have important roles to play. The best opportunities for anyone living with a disability or not start with good health, or at the very least having confidence that you're on the path in trying to achieve this. With one in four Scots experience mental health issues, Miles Briggs is right to point out the need to tackle the issue. And I am proud that we have recognised the importance of mental health and look forward to the publication of our policy next week and how this will be fleshed out. I should point out that this is... Um, sorry. The best opportunity for anyone living with a disability or not also starts with education. And it's concerning to see that only 64% of young people with a disability participate in education as compared to nearly 73% of able-bodied people in Scotland. We should do our utmost to ensure that those with disabilities, and that includes those with learning disabilities, are supported through primary, secondary and higher education. The Scottish Conservatives have always supported additional funding to follow pupils with additional support needs. And this is why I would note a slight error of caution about the Enable report this week which showed concern among parents, teachers and carers over the Scottish Government's flagship policy for pupils with learning difficulties in mainstream schools. Of course, I recognise the Scottish Government has those pupils' interests at heart, but I would urge it to look specifically at the, lack, at the reported lack of specialist support teachers, lack of training for mainstream teachers and feelings of isolation among ASN pupils. The best opportunities for anyone living with a disability or not start with employment for those who can and want to. And I think it's right that we try to eradicate the myths around the UK government's work choice programme. People receiving ESA are never sanctioned for not finding work or for not applying for jobs. Adam Tompkins was right to emphasise the relationship between health and work as stated in the UK Government's Work, Health and Disability Green Paper. Work is as important to health as health is to work. And this is why I commend the Scottish Government for mimicking our policy to half the employment disability gap, as well as the announcement of a £14 million Work First programme. And as Jeremy Balfour pointed out, the current rate of disability employment in Scotland is 42%. And this is lower than when the SNP first came to power and is lower than the UK average by nearly 6%. I am pleased to see initiatives like that of the Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living, an organisation that equips disabled people with skills needed to break down barriers and seek employment. However, looking ahead, I would urge the Scottish Government 
to take into consideration regional differences. In Glasgow, the disability employment rate is less than 25%, and this contrasts starkly with the Shetland Isles, for example, which has a rate of 88%. That is over 250% higher than Glasgow. I believe that this underlines this. I believe this underlines the need to look into further devolution of both employment services and the range of disability benefits more locally, whether this to be health boards, local authorities or new partnerships. Will the Scottish Government look further at this so that individuals can receive tailored packages to suit their own needs? In closing today, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to again stress the need to move the debate away from the magnifying glass type scrutiny we currently see with regards to UK government welfare benefits. The rhetoric on sanctions and cuts is becoming redundant. The Scottish Government will have the powers it needs to make the changes it wants. I know some of my friends with, with disabilities watching this debate on TV at home would want to know the ins and outs of the legislation to be put forward in the coming years. They would want to know, they would want to know not, not just what's off the cards, but what's going to be on the table. Thank you. I call on Jane Freeman to wind up the debate. Around nine minutes, please, Ms Freeman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start uh, my remarks, first of all, by thanking, as I did earlier, the, those individuals and organisations who've joined us in the gallery um, today to listen to this debate, particularly uh, Inclusion Scotland and indeed Dr Sally Witcher, who I uh, quoted earlier in my opening speech, the Glasgow Disability Alliance, uh, Disability Agenda Scotland, and uh, Jim Elder Woodward, who wrote the foreword uh, to the Disability Delivery Plan. Uh, I also want to thank colleagues, uh, presiding officer from across the chamber for their contributions. And while it is true that we may disagree, and I'll come on to that, on some matters in this area, and indeed in our assessment of the impact of the UK government's policies and actions, I want to focus on the determination I believe we share to increase the pace and the depth of our efforts to win the transformational change that Scotland's one million disabled people deserve. We've had a number of interesting and important contributions during the debate from George Adam. The point that disability is not always visible and the fact that we are founding our delivery plan on the social model of disability, which I believe is, a crit is critical to our approach. Um, from Jeremy Balfour, I couldn't agree more in terms of the importance of stigma. And I want to, us to focus on raising awareness about the potential uh, that disabled people have and the fact that we are losing uh, that when we ignore them, as we uh, have been doing in terms of their rights. I would say in terms of the modern apprenticeship point that he made, whilst there is a great deal more to do, can I just point out that in the first six months of this year, the numbers of disabled people on modern apprenticeship programme uh, has risen by 4.1% to 7.6%. Absolutely, more to do and fine words are not enough, but I think we should recognise progress when it's made. Kate Forbes made an important point about communities and importantly about our responsibility as leaders of a national community that is Scotland to remove barriers and a telling point about what an adequate income actually means and what happens when that adequate income is withdrawn and the degree of social isolation and loneliness that can then be imposed on individuals. Um, from Alec Rowley, I am grateful to Alex and to uh, the Labour benches for their approach to this debate and for their support. I would make the point, of course, that cuts to local government expenditure that he is uh, alluding to are indeed in the same proportion as cuts being made to our own Scottish Government budget. And I, I would also make the point that there has been a 29% increase in expenditure for adult and social care from 2007-2008. And yes, we absolutely do uh, agree and support the need for joined up health and social care. And that will be why we've allocated substantial funds uh, 3 billion over the course of this parliament 
precisely to achieve that and will work with COSLA to make the improvements outlined in the disability plan in terms of the focus of social care towards independent living and the steps that the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing uh, took in terms of uh, care charges. There are difficulties, of course, and differences between us, but I think we both accept that there are political choices to make and whilst we might not agree on the final choices I think we are as one on the need to make them and the intention behind what we want to do. Alison Johnson from the Green Party I'm grateful uh, to Alison and to the Greens for their support and would have welcomed their amendment uh, had it been accepted uh, for debate. I do think she makes an important point about the 120 internships that we are proposing and indeed there could be more. The point I'd make to every member across this chamber is that each and every one of us has a responsibility to be champions for this disability delivery plan and therefore if any member can assist in increasing the number of internships that we can deliver then I would very much welcome that, uh, that assistance. I do think she also made a very important point in terms of working to help disabled people who are in work to stay in work. But I have to say that already we spend £100 million as a Scottish Government in mitigating the worst effects of the Conservative Government's welfare cuts. And I don't accept that the fact that we cannot address the unfairness, uh, every unfairness that is caused by the imposition of UK government policies means that we ha are indicating a tacit acceptance of them. I think that is an unfair charge to put on this Scottish Government. I want to thank... Um, yep, briefly. Alison Johnson. Does the Minister agree with the new powers coming to this Parliament? We will be in a position to top up existing benefits and create new benefits in devolved areas. Jean Freeman. Well, statement. But the fact of the matter is that we uh, have those powers in the overall context with the Scottish budget, and I'm conscious Finance Secretary is sitting right beside me, uh, has itself been decreased by just under 10% in the last period. So the choices that we have to make as a government over all the areas and demands on our expenditure are difficult ones. And I would assure the member that we will make the best possible choices that we can for the people of Scotland. Alex Cole Hamilton, I thank Alex very much for his support and his recognition of the steps that the Scottish Government have taken in this area of work and for the important contribution he made to the development of the National Framework uh, for Families of Disabled Children and I look forward to his continued engagement as we develop that framework. I'm also grateful to Claire Hockey for bringing real life experience uh, to the debate uh, uh, this afternoon uh, and for describing not only the impact that had on her constituent going through that assessment process, but the impact it had on her as a member of this parliament in understanding how it demeans and diminishes people uh, as a process that is unnecessary. No, I won't. I need to keep going. I'm going to power through everybody and not miss anyone out. And turning to uh, Miles Briggs, I think the points he makes about transport are very important. And I have to say, given that he is meeting the Minister uh, for Transport at Waverley, I think he can take it uh, as an assurance that we are taking the issue he's raised in respect to Waverley Station seriously. And I'm grateful to him for the important points he also made with respect to mental health. Uh, Joan McAlpine and uh, Sandra Osborne both contributed uh, importantly to the debate. I think self-directed support at a local level uh, are issues that we do need to address. There are uh, differences and discrepancies that need to be ironed out. And I'm grateful to, uh, to the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health and uh, Wellbeing for the commitment she's made uh, to work with us in tackling those. Finally, let me turn to um, Mark Griffin and um, Adam Tompkins. I want to recognise, before I go any further, the pivotal role uh, that Mr Griffin made in seeing the... Uh, uh, British Sign Language Bill approved in this Parliament in the last session uh, and I would agree with him and indeed with Mr Tompkins that that is that signing in this Parliament is something I hope we will see a great deal more of. I, I should remind him that we did as a government a call on many occasions uh, on the UK government to halt the transfer uh, of PIP in Scotland. I'm happy to keep on repeating that to them 
uh, and we will take the opportunity of our next meeting to do so again. Unfortunately, uh, in this regard, as in some others, the UK Government is not listening to us, um, but we would share your uh, intent that the PIP transfer should not have been uh, carried out in Scotland and should be halted if that is at all possible at this stage. And I recognise uh, his his point about the expectation on this government, indeed on this parliament, in terms of our social security system. And I'm sure that we can work together, although we may have points of difference, in terms of building that rights-based social security system for Scotland. Finally, let me turn to Mr Tompkins and his opening speech. I, I do welcome the significant areas uh, that he outlined where we do agree. But I would gently suggest to Mr Tompkins and to his colleagues that our concerns and our criticisms of UK government policy with particular uh, respect to uh, the welfare reforms are not unfounded, they are not redundant, uh, and they are shared by many particularly disabled people across this country. And actually, the credibility, if I may gently suggest, of my colleagues in the Conservative Party in this chamber would be greatly enhanced if they would recognise that reality for many people across Scotland and indeed recognise the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Mr Tompkins, is much fond of quoting them in this instance that they said, as indeed colleagues from the Labour benches have pointed out, that 26% of people in poverty in Scotland are disabled. Now, that comes directly from UK government welfare reforms that were, in their own terms, deliberately intended to save money, including the employment support allowance cuts, which are part of a 450 million cut in uh, UK government spend on welfare. And it won't do to dismiss the UN report, which accurately says that the UK government are guilty of grave and systematic violations of the rights of disabled people simply to say that we don't like the authors and we don't like how they wrote the report. That won't do, presiding officer. We need to recognise those realities and not pick and choose. Can I finally commend to this parliament this disability delivery plan, the transformational change that we absolutely require, and say to every member in this chamber that I look forward to their active engagement with me in the delivery of the, the rights that disabled people need to have, should have, and that make the rights of all of us so much more meaningful. Thank you. That concludes the debate on creating a fairer Scotland, our disability delivery plan, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business.